Chapter fifty two of Louisa de la Valliere. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines. Louisa de la Valliere by Alexandra Dumas. Chapter fifty two. Two Jealousies. Lovers are tender towards everything that forms part of the daily life of the object of their affection. Raoul no sooner found himself alone with Montalais than he kissed her hand with rapture. "'There, there,' said the young girl sadly. "'You are throwing your kisses away. I will guarantee that they will not bring you back any interest.' "'How so? Why? Will you explain to me, my dear Ara?' madame will explain everything to you i am going to take you to her apartments what silence and throw away your dark and savage looks the windows here have eyes the walls have ears have the kindness not to look at me any longer be good enough to speak to me aloud of the rain of the fine weather and of the charms of england at all events interrupted raoul i tell you i warn you that wherever people may be i know not how madame is sure to have eyes and ears open i am not very desirous you can easily believe of being dismissed or thrown into the bastille let us talk i tell you or rather do not let us talk at all raoul clenched his hands and tried to assume the look and gait of a man of courage it is true, but of a man of courage on his way to the torture chamber. Mondelet, glancing in every direction, walked along with an easy swinging gait, and holding up her head pertly in the air, preceded him to Madame's apartments, where he was at once introduced. Well, he thought, this day will pass away without my learning anything. Guiche showed too much consideration for my feelings. He had no doubt come to an understanding with Madame and both of them, by a friendly plot, agreed to postpone the solution of the problem. Why have I not a determined, inveterate enemy? That serpent Duard, for instance, that he would bite is very likely, but I should not hesitate any more. To hesitate, to doubt, better far to die. The next moment Raoul was in Madame's presence. Henrietta, more charming than ever, was half lying, half reclining in her armchair, her small feet upon an embroidered velvet cushion. She was playing with a kitten with long silky fur, which was biting her fingers and hanging by the lace of her collar. Madame seemed plunged in deep thought, so deep indeed, that it required both Montalais and Raoul's voice to disturb her from her reverie. "'Your Highness sent for me?' repeated Raoul madame shook her head as if she were just awakening and then said good morning monsieur de bragelonne yes i sent for you so you have returned from england yes madame and am at your royal highness's commands thank you leave us mandelay and the latter immediately left the room you have a few minutes to give me monsieur de bragelonne have you not my life is at your royal highness's disposal raoul returned with respect guessing that there was something serious in these unusual courtesies nor was he displeased indeed to observe the seriousness of her manner feeling persuaded that there was some sort of affinity between madame's sentiments and his own in fact every one at court of any perception at all knew perfectly well the capricious fancy and absurd despotism of the princess's singular character madame had been flattered beyond all bounds by the king's attention she had made herself talked about she had inspired the queen with that mortal jealousy which is the stinging scorpion at the heel of every woman's happiness madame in a word in her attempts to cure a wounded pride found that her heart had become deeply and passionately attached we know what madame had done to recall raoul who had been sent out of the way by louis the fourteenth raoul did not know of her letter to charles the second although d'artagnan had guessed its contents who will undertake to account for that seemingly inexplicable mixture of love and vanity that passionate tenderness of feeling that prodigious duplicity of conduct no one can indeed not even the bad angel who kindles the love of coquetry in the heart of a woman monsieur de bragelonne said the princess after a moment's pause 
have you returned satisfied bragelonne looked at madame henrietta and seeing how pale she was not alone from what she was keeping back but also from what she was burning to say said satisfied what is there for me to be satisfied or dissatisfied about madame but what are those things which a man of your age and of your appearance is usually either satisfied or dissatisfied how eager she is thought raoul almost terrified what venom is it she is going to distill into my heart and then frightened at what she might possibly be going to tell him and wishing to put off the opportunity of having everything explained which he had hitherto so ardently wished for yet had dreaded so much he replied i left madame a dear friend in good health and on my return i find him very ill you refer to monsieur de guiche replied madame henrietta with imperturbable self-possession i have heard he is a very dear friend of yours he is indeed madame well it is quite true he has been wounded but he is better now oh monsieur de guiche is not to be pitied she said hurriedly and then recovering herself added but has he anything to complain of has he complained of anything is there any cause of grief or sorrow that we are not acquainted with i allude only to his wound madame so much the better then for in other respects monsieur de guiche seems to be very happy he is always in very high spirits i am sure that you monsieur de bragelonne would far prefer to be like him wounded only in the body for what indeed is such a wound after all raoul started alas he said to himself she is returning to it what did you say she inquired i did not say anything madame you did not say anything you disapprove of my observation then you are perfectly satisfied i suppose raoul approached closer to her madame he said your royal highness wishes to say something to me and your instinctive kindness and generosity of disposition induce you to be careful and considerate as to your manner of conveying it will your royal highness throw this kind forbearance aside i am able to bear everything and i am listening ah replied henrietta what do you understand then that which your royal highness wishes me to understand said raoul trembling notwithstanding his command over himself as he pronounced these words in point of fact murmured the princess it seems cruel but since i have begun yes madame once your highness has deigned to begin will you condescend to finish henrietta rose hurriedly and walked a few paces up and down her room what did monsieur de guiche tell you she said suddenly nothing madame nothing did he say nothing ah how well i recognize him in that no doubt he wished to spare me and that is what friends call friendship but surely monsieur d'artagnan whom you have just left must have told you no more than de guiche madame henrietta made a gesture full of impatience as she said at least you know all the court knows i know nothing at all madame not the scene in the room no madame not the tete -tete in the forest no madame nor the flight to chalot raoul whose head dropped like a blossom cut down by the reaper made an almost superhuman effort to smile as he replied with the greatest gentleness i have had the honor of telling your royal highness that i am absolutely ignorant of everything that i am a poor unremembered outcast who has this moment arrived from england there have rolled so many stormy waves between myself and those i left behind me here that the rumor of none of the circumstances your highness refers to has been able to reach me henrietta was affected by his extreme pallor his gentleness and his great courage the principal feeling in her heart at that moment was an eager desire to hear the nature of the remembrance upon which the poor lover retained of the woman who had made him suffer so much monsieur de bragelonne she said that which your friends have refused to do i will do for you whom i like and esteem very much i will be your friend on this occasion you hold your head high as a man of honor should and i deeply regret that you may have to bow before ridicule and in a few days it might be contempt ah exclaimed raoul perfectly livid it is as bad as that then 
"'If you do not know,' said the princess, "'I see that you guess. "'You were affianced, I believe, to Mademoiselle de la Valliere? "'Yes, madame. "'By that right you deserve to be warned about her, "'as some day or other I shall be obliged to dismiss Mademoiselle de la Valliere from my service.' "'Dismiss la Valliere?' cried Bragelonne. "'Of course. "'Do you suppose I shall always be amenable to the tears and protestations of the king?' no no my house shall no longer be made a convenience for such practices but you tremble you cannot stand no madame no said bragelonne making an effort over himself i thought i should have died just now that was all your royal highness did me the honor to say that the king wept and implored you yes but in vain returned the princess who then related to raoul the scene that took place at chalot and the king's despair on his return she told him of his indulgence to herself and the terrible word with which the outraged princess the humiliated coquette had quashed the royal anger raoul stood with his head bent down what do you think of it all she said the king loves her he replied but you seem to think she does not love him alas madame i was thinking of the time when she loved me henrietta was for a moment struck with admiration at this sublime disbelief and then shrugging her shoulders she said you do not believe me i see how deeply you must love her and you doubt if she loves the king i do until i have a proof of it forgive me madame but she has given me her word and her mind and heart are too upright to tell a falsehood you require a proof be it so Come with me, then. End of chapter 52. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah.